Who should be on your strategic planning team? We're talking about that this week on the Church Revitalization Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast, brought to you by the Malfers Group team, where each week we tackle important, actionable topics to help churches thrive. And now, here's your hosts, Scott Ball and AJ Matthew. Welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast. My name is Scott Ball. I'm joined by my friend and co-host, AJ Matthew. A couple of quick things, AJ. We did hear from um, some folks about the introduction and said it's wonderful. So (laughs) we're keeping it. Good to hear. It's it's staying, at least for now. Um, But things that aren't wonderful, how I'm feeling. I'm just gonna put that put that out there. This is gonna be the podcast hosted by Sneezy. And um your your voice is a whole octave deeper. It it normal. is indeed. I, I don't know if I could even make it. I could maybe maybe get into my normal voice. No. I was gonna go with the bass voice. Yes, I could Yeah. So I don't know. Voice. I don't know where what you're feeling, where you're at. Uh, I think something something's going around some cold some something could be allergies could be all of the combined everyone in my house has a cold except for my son um but three of the four of us have a cold and we were um, together last week we were in the same place i was in east tennessee yeah we were trained up some new guides last week so that was awesome and now we're sick so yeah yeah when you had you had it before me so yeah I don't know. I'm not blaming you. I'm also not not blaming you. So, um, all that to say, if uh, if you're watching this, I, I don't I don't know that you can. If you see me go off camera at some point, it's probably because I'm blowing my nose or sneezing. Then, um, and I'll, I'll try, try to try keep to hit that mute. off the audio. Yeah, I'll hit mute <laughs> before I cough. I, I'll do my best <laughs> to do that. Uh, yeah. So, okay. All right. Hey, that aside. Me- Before we get into this week's episode, uh, I just want to hit you from the top of the show this time. Um, We need your support in the international work that we're doing around the world, building up global churches and pastors, leadership teams. Go to mountfirstgroup.com slash donate today. Any donation is helpful. I mean, if you're like, "Ah, my $20 isn't going to help. Yeah, it will. It will help. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, But you know what? If your church could come in at $100 a month as a mission partner with us, that would be amazing uh, because it won't take a whole lot of you to do that, to be able to support our international work in a significant way. Uh, so I don't, I not mean more than two of you. We need more than $200 a month to make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> so go to malfordgroup.com slash donate and then uh, click on donate now. Uh, take this to your missions team, uh, pray over this uh, because we have a huge, huge opportunity uh, to do a lot of impactful work around the world with churches. Um, and Munich is coming up next week. So last minute, um, uh, that trip is not fully funded. We have enough, we had enough to be able to get the, uh, to get the initial travel expenses covered. Um, but all of the, all of the pieces that go along with making our ministry work aren't there for that trip. Uh, go in there and, and help us get over the, the goal line on that one. And then next month coming up, I'm going to be talking to you about a new mission trip next month and it's Thailand. So um, help us finish our goal on Munich and then start thinking about Southeast Asia too. So, all right, let's talk about strategic planning teams, Scott. Um, This is the very beginning of any, any of the work that we do, our two primary functions that we do with churches, strategic planning, revitalization, and leadership pipeline. Both of them are in a team environment. Um, This is not something that we just train up a pastor to do this in his church. So that's what we're talking about this week is what does this team look like? Um, It's been a long time since we've covered this topic, even though it's super foundational. And we really just kind of, we started this year doing kind of a foundational series, but we didn't start with building your revitalization team. So, uh, so that's where we're at this week. Um, Who, who are we going to tap for this? How big does this team need to be? All we're going to try to answer these questions for you today. Um, So let's start off Scott though, just by asking the question, why does a team matter? Why do we even want to do this in a team environment to begin with? Yeah, you probably will hear us um, by default slip into calling this a strategic leadership team. That's the language we use in the strategic envisioning process we do with churches. But it doesn't matter what you call them. You could have a revitalization team, strategic planning team. It's just semantics. But um, here's the thing. If you are a pastor, 
um, or an elder or some other leader in the church, and you want to implement a new vision or a new direction in the church or some some new initiative or some new ministry direction or uh, implement a leadership pipeline or a discipleship pathway or a new mission statement, you name it, any of these kinds of things, and you unilaterally go in, guns blazing. I'm going to, I've got a bold vision for the future of this church. Good luck getting it anywhere than just across the starting line. You're not going to get it across the finish line because people need to have ownership in the process and they need to feel like, um, not just feel like they were involved, but actually be involved. Um, and so you want to give people a voice. You want to give people an opportunity to participate in the formation of it. And um, you're going to get, I hate the word buy-in. Like, I think that that's, you know, you're not selling anything. So um, I like ownership better. You're going to have a lot more ownership in that vision when people yeah. have had a voice in shaping it. Um, and uh, so for all of those reasons, you need a team. And and the way that that team takes shape is going to depend a little bit. We're going to talk about this later. Um, but depend on the size of your church. And so the comp exact composition will vary, but the fact that you need a team doesn't shift. doesn't matter if you're a church of 20 people or 20,000 people. If you're going to shape the vision for the church, you need a team alongside you working on that. Yeah. We've got a little bit of, um, a little bit of belief happening in this as well in, in regard to God's sovereignty. I mean, we, we believe that God sovereignly brings churches together. Um, now, we also believe God is sovereign in you being the pastor of the church. And you might go, well, I believe God sovereignly made me the sole person that's going to do this, and I don't need anybody. But that's that's between you and God. Um, but Good luck. I'll just say good luck with that. Yeah. yeah. But uh, And we're not talking about involving the entire church. You know, you're like, mm -hmm. all right, let's get everybody together. I have 100 people in here, and let's we'll all – be unanimous and everything. That's never going to work. But yeah. as far as raising up leaders in the church, so God's sovereignty is at play and the leaders that he raises up and equips in your church to work together to accomplish his goals, his vision, his will for your church. Um, this is just a, a healthy way of having perspectives. It's also provides some checks and balances um, yeah. that, that people can, can uh, work through, wrestle with concepts and ideas um, and, and be able to check one another and go, you know what? I, yeah, I, I feel that too. I feel like the spirit is, is moving us in that direction. This seems like, a it aligns with scripture in a healthy way. It seems like the right decision for our church together. Um, it also builds trust with the people out who aren't even a part of the team. Yeah. Cause they, they go, um, you know, I mean, if, if you're a pastor, you know, this there's, you've got some people who maybe don't a hundred percent trust you. Um, or they're just used to hearing what you have to say and maybe ignoring it. But it's harder to ignore Sally or Sam or or John. Yeah. And I, I I serve alongside these people. I I you know I volunteer with them or I'm in a small group with them. And and when they say something or when they are taking some sort of stake or ownership in the formation and the communication of changes, mm -hmm. it's harder to ignore and it's harder to write off as just uh, it's just what. Um, that's just what Pastor Bob always says, or or, or yeah. whatever. Does that make sense? So there's a credibility thing there, and it builds trust with the whole church. It builds trust beyond just the people who are involved directly in the formation of the of of the vision and the strategic plan. Yeah, right. Because those people they've got their own spheres of influence. They have their circles of friends, and while you, as the pastor, of course, in a smaller church, more so in a larger church, less so, you also have you know more personal relationships with people and a sphere of influence, but. It's going to it's going to be helpful for the church as a whole to have this team be able to go out as ambassadors, as cheerleaders uh, for the changes, um, to be able to to work in in their close friend groups um, to gr build greater unity in the church, which is ultimately what we want to see. Uh, we want right. to see the church very unified in a vision and mission going forward, and in positive changes that are going to be made um, that you'd have greater acceptance earlier. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's also always going to be the early adopters, the, the midterm, the late adopters on things. But, um, whenever, whenever we've got a greater number of people that are putting these things out, these ideas out, um, I think you can get more people engaged in a 
in a in a positive way closer to the front of of front end of the change and see yeah, it the, uh, see it succeed the last thing i want to say on that before we move on um and this may just be understood already with the other things we've said but then people begin to associate it with this is the church's vision and direction and not yeah. you know this is pastor bob's vision yeah um yeah. which never maybe would have been your intent in the first place but that's how people would perceive it you know if 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 you're the one presenting it and you're the one who developed it and you're the one talking about it all the time um the number of times we walk into churches aj that we're doing this process with and people want to get away from a perfectly good mission statement there's nothing wrong with it we know we take it through our process and evaluation and all of that and there's nothing wrong with it but they want to get away from it because they associate that mission statement with oh that was that was pastor so and so's mission statement yeah and the church never really owned it so by involving more people you're you're trying to get away from that happening where there's this perception of oh this was this pastor's vision rather than this was the church's vision yeah or yeah. or more accurately, God's vision for our church. Right. Um, Did we mention the board? Having boards involved? No, we're going to get into that. <laughs> I already forgot. I'm not even. I'm not tracking with us. Uh, I'm not able to process what we've already <laughs> yeah, talked we're, about. We're getting. We're going. We're going there. Okay. All right. Next. All right. Um, so, qualities. Team member qualities. Is that where we're going next, Scott? Let's go there, my friend. Okay. Let's talk about who should actually be on the team. The qualities of the people that we're asking to be on the team. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a, there's a term that goes back before Scott and myself were even part of the team. Uh, Dr. Malfers, um, had always been using this, this term known leaders. Um, and so unpacking known leaders, um, I think that's still a good word to use people that they may or may not be in an, in an official leadership capacity with a title. They probably are, or they probably have been in the past. Maybe they're not today. But people just know they're a leader in the church. They're respected. Um, right. You know, they're mature. Uh, these are the kinds of people that are are good potential people to be on a, on a strategic planning, strategic leadership team in the church. Um, but people with a positive outlook on the future. We don't having it trying to plan for the future with people that are generally negative is is going to be a, a battle. It's going to yeah gonna something. Be on, you, I don't know if you got this from from Aubrey or or Ron or someone else in the past, but um, something you say that I I always tell churches to I got it from you is um, I've heard you say this is not your olive branch moment, right? Where you go, okay, I have this really cantankerous individual, yeah, and I want to invite them to sort of smooth this thing over. This is not the time for that. This is not the the best right. moment. Early, early in my career, was the the church in which that phrase ended up being uh, used later. Um, I don't remember if I was the first one to say that, but I was involved <laughs> in the environment in which it became necessary to say. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we don't. If if somebody has been a thorn in your side. They're just going to be a thorn in your side in another new environment. So um, <laughs> it's not that we don't want you to work on mending that relationship, but. Well, this... and also not that you don't want um, a sort of a variety of opinions. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. We certainly want opinions. Yeah. Different perspectives and people disagree, people who might yeah. disagree with you even openly. Yeah. Um, that's not a problem. It's, you know, the difference between someone who is. I'm just going to be against anything you say, no matter right. what it is. That's it's not the same as someone who is like, oh, I see this differently. I disagree. Yeah. yeah. Somebody that might, yeah, maybe brings a different perspective and they maybe they'll throw a little challenge out there. But what about this? Have you, th what, do you think it would go this way instead of the way you're thinking? That's okay. Um, because in a, in a group of people that might, might have that personality to them, we can talk about it. So yeah, uh, as right. mentioned, people that are mature enough, to have conversations where we can, we can bat around, you know, what ifs and still come yeah. to a good decision together. Uh, right. That's, that's who we're looking for. And of course, people right now that are leading ministries, if they're, if they're um, doing well in leadership positions, leading ministries in the church, then uh, these are all potential people. Um, hopefully yeah. you would have more than enough people. 
um, in which case you need to maybe narrow it down. Uh, and we've got tools that we use churches to help um, to, to help narrow that list down. Um, but are we starting to, do you think, Scott, are we doing a good job today of talking about who should be on the team? Uh, yeah, I mean, you're just trying to think of an image of a per like, <clears throat> maybe think of it this way. Maybe here's just a good shorthand. Um, every church has, to some degree, the 80-20 rule at, at play. Um, and who are those 20% who get 80% of it done? Um, and you might be thinking, well, they're already, they already got a lot on their plate. That may be true. Um, but these are the kinds of people you're, you're thinking about people who go the extra mile. They're, they're there, they're present. They're not just there on Sundays, mm -hmm. uh, showing up and sitting in the pews and keeping it warm. Um, they are engaged, they're serving. It doesn't matter if they're running a ministry or not. You know, it could be just a person who's they're you know, they've been teaching the same Sunday school class for, for 10 years and they love it. Um, so we're not looking for a certain position or a certain title or any of that. We're looking for people who have influence in the church, who are generally positive, who have godly character, who want to see the church move forward in a positive direction, and who have enough engagement in the church to be able to give good advice. Um, you know, people who used to be involved or used to be connected but haven't in a long time. I'll get this. I haven't gotten this in a while, but I occasionally would get like, should we include some people who have maybe stopped going to our church, at mm -hmm. least in our evaluation process? And I'm like, no, <laughs> I mean, I no, 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 probably no. I mean, like maybe you did an exit interview with them. There might be some value in that. In planning for the future, we don't need to look backwards. No, so. sorry. Uh, producers, not consumers. Right. All right. So, so we've talked about the qualities of the the individual team members. Um, how about the overall makeup of the team, the composition of the team? Uh, mm -hmm. So let's talk about size and mm -hmm. and overall kind of what we're going for in what that team's going to end up looking like. Okay. So we, I generally advise churches twelve to fifteen um, is an optimal size. Um, if your church is particularly small, like, you know, maybe under 75 people or under 50 people, which actually is the median size church in the United States is 60 people. So um, half of all churches are 60 or fewer. So 12 to 15 might be hard for you to come up with. That would be solid. I'd rather you have a better, a good team than an arbitrary number. So if you've got 10 solid folks, I'd rather have your 10 solid folks than an extra five who are dead weight <laughs> in the process. Yeah. So, but 12 to 15 is kind of the, the target we're looking for. And then we're looking for a broad cross section of the church. So men and women, um, this is not a long-term um, quality structure thing. So it doesn't matter what your theological perspective is, should be okay to have men and women in this group. And as much range as you have. So it doesn't need to be, we're not looking for proportional representation, like 20% of our church is under 40. So 20% of the team needs to be under 40. We're not looking for, for that, but if everybody on the team is over 65 and there's no one younger than that, but you do have that in the church, like there would be people, you might want to consider inviting some folks onto the team who are maybe a little bit younger. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, and then I guess I want to just note I'm I'm talking normatively. So churches that are of normative size, which would be like a normative size church is 200 or less, but this would apply even to a church that's I'd say under 500. Um, we're looking at 12 to 15 people, a mix of lay leaders in the church, just volunteers, staff, and board members whether that might could be deacons or elders, depending on how you're structured, council members, whatever, but we don't want it dominated by just your board. Um, yeah. We want it to be a mix. Did I cover the bases? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, a little bit larger churches. If you have, if your primary ministry leaders are paid staff, then we would, we would push a little bit more into the paid staff dominated right. group right yeah 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 so if you're over 500 you know if you've got a if you've got a staff of 10 people 
um, a paid staff of 10 people. I'm not talking about like the guy you pay a hundred bucks a week to help run sound. I'm not talking about that. I'm, I'm talking about ministry staff, ministry staff. Yeah. Um, you know, probably then it gets harder. The larger you are, the harder it is to get good advice from, from volunteers because there's so much that's happening operationally that they just don't know. They can't speak into it. Well, um, it might be frustrating for them. The process might. So the larger you are, the more staff dependent your process is going to become. But most churches that we work with, this is not their situation They're You know, they're, they're under 500, they're, they're under 200. Um, and so you're, you're looking mostly at lay leaders plus, you know, a couple of staff plus doesn't need to be your whole elder board. Like you don't need to automatically reserve. If you've got six elders, you don't need to automatically reserve six of those seats for all your elders. It's okay to just invite two or three, um, and then leave some other seats open for other people. Yeah, exactly. All right. So the last piece we're going to cover is, is, uh, what should be expected for the commitment to the, to the work. Um, because it's not, it's not just a one and done thing. There's a, it's a process and it mm-hmm. takes time to do that. So, um, initially now, and we'll speak more specifically to the team that would actually be built to work with the Malfurs group, um, or healthy churches global in for our, in our international context. Um, so it's just these, this 12 to 15 people is first going to go through, well, they're going to, they're going to, uh, participate in our church ministry analysis. So they're going to be asked, um, to go through an assessment of the church. And again, we want these same qualifications, um, for people that take that assessment because it's geared towards, towards it's the questions, uh, where the areas that are being evaluated are, uh, more so that ministry people involved in ministry and, and leading ministries would be equipped to answer. So, so that's first part uh, is taking the assessment There's um, mm-hmm. a training piece that happens then. So this is going to be some evenings or some weekend time involved in that. There's going to be yep. um, a full weekend of work, pretty, pretty intense work then um, on another, you know, at least partial weekend um, in the planning process it's going to be then um, the beginning of an implementation phase. So this is really where it gets into the primary commitment. And that is in monthly meetings, um, only a couple hours a month, but still regular recurring monthly meetings. And the in-between work, the work that just the ongoing implementation phase work that the team members are going to be required to engage in, along with others, this team would grow. Um but we've we've really got about fifteen months of engagement, um, and twelve months of that being in the implementation phase. Um, yep. And things can begin to change after that. Some churches choose to continue um, and just uh, and continue to work on on new or updated projects um, year after year, utilizing a similar format. Sometimes the the team more gets absorbed into um, other existing ministry teams or maybe newly created ministry teams. But for our purposes today, talking about the strategic planning team, um, we've got about 15 months of engagement. So that's something that people need to consider when they're, they accept the invitation to be on the team, knowing that um, that that's going to be there. Of course, things happen in life. um, And if, if, you know, a few people need to end up getting changed out, it's not the end of the world. Um, yep. but when you get to the implementation know. phase, you'll probably yeah. add some additional people to be involved in the process. Yeah. Yep. So that's, that's the commitment that, that we're asking people to be engaged in. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it, so it's not, it's not horrible, uh, but it, it adds something and it adds something to your, to your life. It adds, it adds time that, um, is taken away from your family and, um, uh, and, but we want people to know that on the front end, it's important work, it's worthy work, um, and and it's work that produces fruit uh, because those churches that continue to, to, to strive towards these goals, continue to meet together, continue to do the work, positive change happens in the church. So it's something that a year later, you could go back, you could look back on and say, this was worthy of my time. We did good things and our church is better off for it. Our church is set up now to to do better into the future as well because one year um you'll see positive change but you, you know you're not gonna 
completely rebuild a church um, and, you know, and double it, triple it in size in a year. That's that's not right. realistic. Uh, but I think it's work that most of the time the team looks back on. And they're like, I'm glad I, glad I did this um, because we've seen positive things. Yeah, I think all that's that's good and right. I think um I think a feature of our process um at the Malfors group <clears throat> is that we don't take 6 months plus in just the planning phase. Um because then churches, you know, 6 months in they start thinking, man, we've invested you know, all these weekends and all this time in this. But you haven't actually done anything yet. <laughs> like you've just the quality of work is not demonstrably better just because you took six months to do it. Um, the, and it's much easier to steer a moving car than a parked one anyway. So if we, we're not trying to rush through the planning phase, but we do want to get from planning to implementation, you know, in as, as, as quickly as is reasonable. Yeah. Because you're going to be making adjustments when reality hits your plan anyway. So there's there's really no benefit to taking an inordinate amount of time, and it just wears your team down and, and tricks them into thinking they've done something when they haven't done anything yet. So that's a feature of our process, I think, is we're trying to get you within three months or so to get you to the implementation phase, which is a year long. And um, and. I think the other thing you mentioned this, but just to highlight it again, um, our process is built for sustainability. We don't we don't want to burn out your team. We recognize that those people on your team probably already are volunteering in other areas anyway. So, you know, we're looking for one meeting a month. That's it. And we're not looking for you may have some tasks to execute yeah. in between meetings, but just one meeting a month. Um, it's not like you should be able to walk and chew gum. You know, it is a commitment. I don't want to say, oh, it's no big deal. It's a one meeting a month, but it's also not like soul crushing, you know, every week we're meeting, you know, it's yeah. it's designed to be something that you can take on um, with a reasonable level of commitment to the yeah. church. Yeah. You know, my, my son learned to fly airplanes a couple of years ago, and uh, it's sometimes surprising to people to, to learn that, ground school, like initial stuff really doesn't last that long before they get you up into an airplane and you start flying and you take the controls. Um, and I think we have kind of a similar approach. I mean, let's not, let's not burn out on, in our, in ground school. Let's, let's get the basics going and then let's get out and start flying. Um, and you know, you have to make adjustments in the air, you know, and, and you adapt to the conditions that, that are coming at you. But we, I think we have a similar approach to, to strategic planning in the church. Let's make some good plans. Um, and as quickly as we can, let's start getting our, getting our hands on the controls and, um, uh, and going somewhere, actually making progress towards a destination. Uh, yep. and, and I, we get positive, positive feedback on that approach, um, that, um, people feel like we're actually getting things done and we want you to get things done. So, um, yeah, yeah we don't There's just want things. you to feel like you're getting things done. <laughs> we yeah. want you to get things done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Actual things. Um, yeah. all right, well, there you go. There's an overview of, of the strategic planning team. Uh, and as you mentioned, we call it the strategic leadership team, um, of actually doing the work. So yeah, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while and you're like, okay, I kind of, you know, we hear us talk about concepts, components, of church revitalization and healthy churches. Um, but how is it actually executed? Maybe you, you are the solo pastor in a small church and, and, um, maybe you even feel overwhelmed. Like these guys talk about all these things. How am I ever going to do this? Well, we don't expect you to do it by yourself. We want you to want to see you right. do it in a team environment. Um, yeah. and then one step beyond that is we want to see you doing it in a team environment and us help guide you through it, which is always an option. Um, and if you go to malfordsgroup.com, slash uh i don't know or click on the orange button there's an orange button up there right scott it says uh connect, connect with, with a guide, guide. Yeah. um then we could start that conversation about partnering with you and your team uh to even get you further down further down the line faster so uh we'd love to talk with you about that hey i'll go is that the end scott are we at the end that's it. That's what we had planned to talk about. I hope it's still two hundred and thirty-seven in the can. Malfordgroup dot com slash two thirty seven is where today's article is. There's a link over there to watch this on YouTube, uh, if you so desire. Thanks for being with us. 
Let us know um, if there's topics that you would like us to cover. Um, you can do that by emailing us, leadership at malfortruth.com, or maybe leave a comment on YouTube is a good feature that you could use for that too. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you again next week.